With all the children of your holy church, we glorify and thank you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. raise glory, honor, and praise to the good and merciful Lord, who in his compassion came down to us and became flesh. He chose to taste death to save us, and he descended to the realm of the dead. By his resurrection he gave joy to his disciples, and gave light to the nations with the light of his salvation. To the good one we glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O word of God, who can adequately praise you for the depth of your compassion? And what voice can bless you, for you are above all praise. Neither mind nor tongue can describe the wonders you accomplished on Sunday, the day of your resurrection from the dead. And so with the psalmist David we cry out, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Now, Christ our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense, which we offer you to forgive our sins, give peace of mind to those in distress, and comfort to those who are anxious. Bring back those who are far, and watch over those who are near. I, the shepherd, sanctify the priest and purify the deacons. Pardon all sinners and guard the righteous, protect orphans and help widows, drive away all conflicts and put an end to all dissension. Remember the faithful departed and grant them rest in your heavenly kingdom that with them we may celebrate that eternal feast. We raise glory to you, to your blessed Father, and to your whole living Holy Spirit, now and forever.
of the sweet fragrance of our incense and make us worthy to announce your resurrection with the angels, to proclaim it along with your women disciples and to rejoice in your victory with your pure apostles. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hence, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed you from the law of sin and death. For what the law, weakened by the flesh, was powerless to do, God has done. By sending his own Son, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for the sake of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that righteous, the righteous decree of the law might be fulfilled in us, who live not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh are concerned with the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit are concerned with the things of the Spirit. The concern of the flesh is death, but the concern of the Spirit is life and peace. For the concern of the flesh is hostility towards God. It does not submit to the law of God, nor can it. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit. If only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. 
But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also. Through this, his spirit that dwells in you. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. For the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Apostle Matthew writes, but the Pharisees went out and they took counsel against Jesus in order to destroy him. And when Jesus realized this, he withdrew from that place. And many people followed him and he cured them all. But he warned them not to make him known. This was in order to fulfill what had been spoken through Isaiah the prophet Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I delight. I shall place my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not contend or cry out, nor shall anyone hear his voice in the public streets. A bruised reed he shall not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings forth justice to victory, and in his name the nations shall hope. This is the truth, peace be with you. But Jesus, knowing this, retired from there, and many followed him, and he cured them all. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. Past, present, and future, if we keep in mind that all the divine mysteries, the sacraments, always encompass an aspect which is past, of the present ceremony 
the present sacrament taking place, the grace that is given, and the future always looking towards our Lord's appearance at the end of time. It's important, past, present, and future. So that even when, for example, the baptism takes place, the water that's being poured is already hearkening back to our Lord's death and resurrection, making it present in the present grace that not only is signified by the cleansing of the water being poured, but is also effecting that symbolism which is cleansing the person being baptized. But that is only disposing the individual, turning them towards the day of judgment, to the appearance of our Lord in his fullness. Now these things we know from our catechism, but it's important that we bring them up because living in a non-Catholic world as we are, people see these things at church as being just ceremonies, just something that happens. And so effectively, when you finally finish with Protestantism, is really just being about the individual. And we're having a hard time with this because in the Maronite tradition, like in all the Catholic traditions, Everything is about the body of Christ. Everything is about the body, the members of Christ, and not about the individual. And especially when it comes to the question of funerals, well, it is the accompaniment of the other members of the body of Christ who surround the deceased and the deceased family and accompany them from the home and the wake to the church, the ceremonies around the preparation and the solemn farewell and the respect shown to the body and then the accompaniment to the actual interment and then the prayers that follow after that and then the masses that are offered in memory of this person on the ninth day, the seventh day, the 30th, the 40th day, the anniversary. It's always about accompaniment. And yet when we deal with it so often these days, it's so painful because I want this and I want that and can we do it this way and can we do it that way and it's like it's not about an individual as they say these days a celebration of life and if you want a celebration of life go rent the Elks Hall and just go do that someplace but that is not the church it's not how the body of Christ works and we bring it up because the gospel today of St. Matthew is scriptures within scriptures, if you notice. St. Matthew is quoting Isaiah chapter 42. And he's doing it to apply to our Lord. This is chapter 12. And so what you can see clearly is the Pharisees, the priests of the temple, the scribes, these men are beginning to figure out how to ruin our Lord, to stop this going on. And so what St. Matthew couples together is what we call one of the songs of the servant of Yahweh from Isaiah. Isaiah is an enormous book in the Old Testament. It dates from about eight centuries before our Lord when Isaiah was working. And it has over 60 chapters. It's quite long. And dispersed among it, you have several of these clearly individual poems within the larger poem. And they're known as the canticles of the songs of the servant of Yahweh. And they deal with someone, as it says today, you have in the bulletin, behold my servant that I have chosen, the one that I have poured my spirit upon. In other of these hymns, it talks about, this is the one who takes upon the sins of all of the nation, the one who suffers for us, for our iniquities. And they've always been very mysterious, and they were especially mysterious before the coming of the Messiah. Because, of course, all of the other messianic texts are about triumph and glory, and he shall reign over the earth, and he shall beat up those who oppose the people of God. But in these, clearly the chosen one of God is one who has suffered. He suffers, he is beaten, he is scourged. He carries the iniquities of others upon him. It's very mysterious. Now, of course, when we look at it, we can see the reconciliation of these prophecies in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. But at the time, it wasn't so clear. So what St. Matthew is doing, because St. Matthew of the four Gospels is the most Jewish of the Gospels. And so he's always throwing in these prophecies in order to understand that our Lord's coming is a fulfillment of what has already been told centuries before. 
And in doing so, he's quoting scripture within scripture. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is because this is where we left off around, I think, somewhere around the Feast of the Ascension. As we were going through the divine liturgy, the parts of the liturgy we led up to, we had finished off with the Mazmur, the hymn that is sung before the reading of the epistle. And to remember again that in our Maronite tradition, everything got flipped around in the 60s, right? So, the Latins now read Old Testament, New Testament, and Gospel, which the Latin church never did except for during Lent on occasion. And the Maronite church throughout its history has read Old Testament, New Testament, and the Gospel. And so in the 90s they decided we're not going to read Old Testament any anymore. Why? I have no idea. But behind the curtain they're certainly rattling the cage to bring back what is effectively our tradition. So it should be Old Testament, the reading of St. Paul, and then a gospel. But what's happening in the scripture readings, of course, is being actualized within the divine sacraments, within the mystery that we call the Eucharist. And therefore, it's more than just simply a reading. It is a proclamation of the text being announced here and now within the divine mysteries, past, present, and future. And it's important for us to understand it because it's another one of these things that we trip over in the modern world. You know, these days we have weddings, we have funerals, and someone doubtless is going to ask the question, well, can my niece read? Well, probably. Oh, you're asking, can she read during the liturgical action of the divine mysteries? Oh, different question. Well, yes, that is allowed. We won't stop you from having your niece. But inevitably what happens is for some young girl has been pulled up because she's relatively pious within the family, and then they throw her up on the bima to read. And she gets up and she reads. In the name of the Lord, she reads. But in the divine mysteries, it's not a reading, it is a proclamation of the word of God that is inspired text to be read and to be announced within that sacramental form. Which is why, as we started moving some of the altar servers up to be able to do some of these readings, we reminded them that when you read, you become, as a sense we could say in the modern world, you become the loudspeaker for the voice of God. You become within the divine mystery at that moment the audible aspect of God's revelation during that moment. So it's not just reading. It's like people ask, can we do an offertory procession? Yes, if you have any idea what you're going to be doing as bringing up the oblations to the altar. Please don't show up in sandals and shorts, which they do on occasion, of course, these days, because we have no idea we're losing the idea of what are the divine sacraments, the rose, as we say in Syriac, the old Persian. But in the scripture readings when they're done, this proclamation, it's important to understand past, present, and future. That the scriptures that are being read in this moment are being read in this time as a revelation of God, turning us towards our Lord's full manifestation at the end of time. So we hear exactly the same epistle that we heard last year on the eighth Sunday of Pentecost. But you're not in the same historical condition you were a year ago, right? Thanks be to God. But at the same time, it's not the same individual for that reason, hearing this same text. That this is a voice that is actualized in its grace within the sacramental form, echoing, in this case, from St. Matthew, a text written 2,000 years ago, inspired text, which is quoting a text from 2,800 years ago. And within the context of the old law within the synagogue and in the new law within the body of Christ, these texts become a moment in which that voice is the voice of God echoed through an individual who was allowed, usually historically, ordained for the purpose. Not just somebody you grab, hey Tilly, you want to do the reading on Tuesday? That is not the mind of the church, I'm sorry. We've done it for 50 years, but that does not make it an ancient tradition. But it also obscures the fact of what we do with the sacramental form. And therefore this individual being ordained, in other words, set aside to be able to be the audible voice of God, 
is what allows it within the divine sacrament to be actuated, to be made actualized, this revelation. And the scriptures are written for the public. They're not individual texts. Some of them, for the letter to Philemon, Timothy, Titus, a few of these letters are written to individuals, but they're not only about Timothy and Titus, which is why they've been preserved, why they are read within the context of the body of Christ. But reading and the announcing is precisely public formula. We, we think now about reading as being a private event, but that's fairly recent. It's only been since the 19th century in the Western world where most people are able to read. Throughout the history of the world, the average person did not have that technical skill. And you know what? Nobody cared. Because you didn't have to read and write to be able to live a perfectly intelligent life. It was a skill. We all use phones. You all have these little computers in your pockets and your purses. But almost probably very few of you, if any, know how to write programs and design these little machines. But it doesn't stop you from using them. St. Augustine, when he goes in and first meets St. Ambrose for the first time, he's amazed because this man is not, when he comes upon him, St. Ambrose is reading. But Ambrose is not verbalizing, he's not reading, we would say, to himself. And St. Augustine's amazed by that because it's one of the first people he's ever seen because even when an individual could read, when they read, they read audibly to themselves. We call that a labialization, that you read the actual text as you're reading it. But of course, within the sacramental form, that reading is an announcement actualizing that voice of God of an inspired text that it winds up becoming in itself a source of grace and it reveals here and now in this voice of the moment of grace, God within his infallible text. Which is why what's taking place, as we mentioned, it's not the same thing you heard a year ago on the eighth Sunday of Pentecost and it will not be the same grace that it carries with it next year on the eighth Sunday of Pentecost. But the last thing that this text winds up doing is transmitting to you what we call tradition. That when in the sacred mysteries we have these readings, this is the handing over, the tradere, the traditio, the handing over, right? The tradition with a capital T that we talk about within the Catholic Church. This handing over the tradition is that reading that is done within the divine mysteries. It's part of the whole mystery. It's not the only part, but it is part of the mystery of what is being confided, of voices which have been from the inspired text, as we have seen, over the last 2,800 years. So that hearing this text of St. Matthew today is the same text that St. Tecla would have heard at the end of the first century, that St. Teresa of Lisieux would have heard in the 19th century. And that whole engrafting of the one body of Christ moving us towards the day of the fullness of our Lord's appearance at the end of time that is what in the individual who is present within the divine mystery, the body of Christ, the individuals are integrated within that divine mystery and oriented towards the appearance of our Lord. I know this is all a bit much when it's 100% humidity, but it is important to understand that what is taking place within these divine liturgies is an actualization revealing the divine word at this moment and integrating us within this text. Because this traditio, this handing over that takes place within the mysteries of the sacraments, requires also what we call the reditio, the handing back. Now, if any of you have been present at baptisms that have been done for adults, well, even with the children, you recite the Apostles' Creed. It's not just there because it's part of something we do as a ceremony, but it's because during the formation of the individual, you hand over to them the Apostles' Creed. They get the schematic form of the Catholic faith. That, that traditio that is given to them, they have to hand back before the body of Christ and show that they have 
committed this to memory, that they know this text. This is why whether as an adult, and the adults would recite the creed during their baptism, or if you were a godparent holding this baby drooling on your arm, you recite the Apostles' Creed for the little creature. But you're doing something which is a ceremony from antiquity of the reditio, of handing back uh, the echo. From the traditio, reditio, we receive in order to give back. And that is the development of our spiritual life. And we bring it up especially today because of St. Benedict, whose feast day commemorates also today. The reason why is because for St. Benedict in his development from the sixth century, his development was that all the men who came to the monasteries obviously had to read because you had to be able to memorize the Psalms and learn the scriptures. And they were part of something you did also in what we call the divine reading, the Lexio Divina, in order to be able to assimilate the divine word, which is why the monasteries became the source then of forming the novices to read and write. Then you also, from there, the rich people said, oh, I'm gonna send you my son too. Make them little oblates, Benedictines, under the juridical fiction that they're actually novices. Put them in the monastery. They learn the read and write, and this is why the Benedictines are the origin of schools in Western Europe. But the idea behind it was, again, the focus upon the text. Of course, don't worry about the noble boys. At 18, they were able to make a decision. Do you really want to stay here the rest of your life? And of course, a lot, most of them opted out, but they had given an education of reading and writing and the, what we call now call the classics. And then from those, we develop our universities. But in this understanding for St. Benedict, the reading, that ability now to be able to perceive this text personally, not just within the divine mysteries, but personally, is now becomes the point of a traditio reditio individually in your own little world of the divine reading, the Lexio Divina. When you read the texts, and very simply you just, you read it, you contemplate it, you ponder it before God and in His grace. You may spend a half an hour doing this Lexio Divina and only actually read two verses, a verse. You look at it front ways, you pray, you turn it around and look at it from the back. You pray, you turn around and look at it from the side. Pray, you turn around and look from the other side, then from the top and from the bottom. And you just assimilate this material. Which is why when you read the fathers of the church, they sound like scripture because they have been so penetrated by these divine texts that they echo it in the reditio in their own teaching. This is also the meaning when I always recommend to you, read these texts during the week. Go back to them. They're in the bulletin, not because you can't hear when I'm reading the gospel. They're there so that you also have the references. You can go to them. You can look at them and make them very much logically, supernaturally, naturally part of the way you live your Catholic life. To simply begin to hear the voice of God in these texts. And in doing so, very much echo the great patriarch of monasticism in the West, St. Benedict. And so, with that, we ask for his intercession, that he obtain for us a great appreciation of the depth of our Catholic faith, to hear the voice of God that echoes the past and orients us towards the future on the day of our Lord's full revelation in the parousia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
we believe in one God, the Father. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before our ages, God from God, right from life, true God from true God, begotten God. confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Iterot ma debhe da loho, valvot a loho da kone taiot, veinam sago taivo ta hokeon al vaitok vespodem chayek lo hor upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saints Mary and Saint Jude, and Saint Benedict. 
Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to God. security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever Amen. O Lord we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies that we may raise glory and thanks to you, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit 
be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim, who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify and proclaim. Awesome is 
this moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Aninmonio, 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 anite mororocho chayo parisho, onachen alainu alu korbono ono. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies, and the strengthening of consciences so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather make us worthy to live by your spirit and to lead a pure life. We raise glory to you now and forever. O Lord, this divine sacrifice for your church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith. With blameless lives and with purity and holiness, may they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have presented these offerings, forgive them so that they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them, for you are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen, the archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Mary, St. Benedict, assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you. Remember, O oh Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith who have endured teaching, who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest, hoping in you, awaiting that life-giving voice, give, calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. And rest, O oh God, to the us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever.
pleasing oblation, who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice, who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest, who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you, to you be glory forever. Compassionate Lord, may we, your lowly servants, be made worthy to pray with purity and with holiness, and to call upon you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways, and do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us. For yours is the kingdom, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit, let us bow our heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and holiness, that through them, we may be forgiven and be made holy, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make, Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassionate and merciful Lord. We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name, and that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. With your Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.